I'm satisfied. Got the cottage below, little silver, little gold in that city. Phantom will shine.
So if you have a copy of God's Word, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 and verses 17 through 20. <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, that's Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. God bless the reading of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, creator of all the universe, thank you for another opportunity to study your word so that we may know more about your perfect character and come into an even more intimate relationship with you, our Lord, our King, and our God. Please forgive us of our sin and of all we do that does not glorify you. Enable us to have more victory over sin by sharing your infinite and perfect knowledge with us in the context of your pristine purity and glorious righteousness. Let us receive it in your wisdom. We thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that washed away our sin. We thank you for clothing us in his righteousness so that we can stand before you worthy and justified. We thank you for this day and all that you provide us. Help us to use the providence that you give us for your glory. Thank you for the light in our eyes, the beat in our hearts, the breath in our lungs, the strength in our bones, and the peace in our spirits. Lord, empty our minds now of our own selfish thoughts so they can be filled with your wisdom. Empty our hearts of our foolish pride so we can humbly accept that which you would teach us tonight. We ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord and together God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you know, some say that ignorance is bliss. And that may be so for those people that have no appetite for truth. I, on the other hand, think that ignorance is not only terrible, but it's dangerous. A mind separated from the reality, a mind separated from reality is defenseless against a world full of lies and misinformation, especially if it receives its information through a heart that fashions its morality out of its own frail fabric, or out of the frail fabric of its own ego and emotion. The worst kind of ignorance is willful ignorance. This is the kind of ignorance that provides convenient excuses for cowards who would rather retreat into their fantasies than their face reality. This is the kind of ignorance that provides a hiding place for lazy mental midgets who would rather be told what to think 
than to do a little bit of thinking on their own. They're like ostriches who stick their head in the sand when danger approaches, or like little bratty children that stick their fingers in their ears and cry, no, 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 when you want to tell them something that they don't want to hear. <clears throat> you see, they don't want to hear any facts that invade the bliss of their ignorance. But the second president of the United States, John Adams, has a statement for that about facts. Facts are stubborn things. And whatever our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions may be, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Reality does not change merely because we choose to ignore it. Truth does not hinge on our belief or our unbelief. A rose, a rose is a rose is a rose. The truth is the truth is the truth. Facts are facts, whether willful or otherwise, Ignorance does nothing to change the facts. You know, one time I got a ticket for doing, doing a 40, 55 and a 45. They had recently changed the speed limit on that stretch of road, piece of road I've been driving all my life. And I told the officer who wrote me the ticket, I, I told him, I said, I was ignorant of the change. I didn't know. Well, he reached out his pad and tore out the ticket and handed it to me and smiled. He said, well, Mr. Bennett, now you know. Have a good night. My ignorance didn't matter then, and it won't matter when we stand before the judgment seat of God. And when we stand there in our ignorance, especially our willful ignorance, we're not going to hear, well, now you know, have a good night. No, we're going to hear, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you. The only thing that can cure ignorance is knowledge rightly received in the context of truth. Only then can we properly process the information and correctly apply it to our lives. That kind of discernment requires wisdom. But what is wisdom? What separates wisdom from mere knowledge? Now some believe there's not any difference between the two. They think that knowledge itself makes us wise. They see wisdom as nothing more than a mass accumulation of knowledge, an uh, intellectual cornucopia of information, experience, and education. While these things are certainly key elements of wisdom, they by themselves, or even in some combination, cannot be equated to wisdom. Information can open up the door to wisdom, but it can't make anybody walk through it. Some people may look inside, shake their heads, and slam the door because they don't want any part of the truth that's on the other side of that door. Experience can lead us to wisdom, but what does experience tell us? Experience tells us that experience does always guarantee that we will garner the wisdom that it offers. Some people come away dumber for, for their experience than they were when they went into it because they refuse to learn the lesson that the experience offered them. Man is an obstinate beast. Renowned physicist Albert Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Well, when I hear this quote, it leaves me questioning the very sanity of humanity because doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, well, that's the theme of American of, of, of human history. That's the, that might as well be our motto. Collectively and individually, man never seems to learn from his mistakes and keeps committing the same errors from generation to generation. It seems that man's insolent pride has created in him an impudence of learning that experience cannot, simply cannot ever come. Education? <laughs> Education is not synonymous with wisdom either. A quick survey of even our most esteemed college campuses today would give crisp evidence of that. Not to denigrate the value of a solid and sound education, because like I pointed out earlier, education is a key component of attaining wisdom. But we've got to be honest with ourselves here. There are a lot of very smart people walking around the halls of academia today professors and students alike that for all their diplomas, for all their degrees and other academic accolades, seem to have had wisdom educated right out of them. For all their study of, of, 
of human anatomy, they can no longer distinguish the difference between a male and a female. For all their study of finance, they fumble with the concept that if you borrow the money, you got to pay it back. They, for all their study of philosophy, they have become disconnected from the purity and integrity of truth. For all of their study of humanities, they propagate hatred. They propagate division and resentment that fits their causes. And this isn't just the colleges and universities. Public schools neglect or marginalize the true teaching of history or civics so that they can, uh, so that certain socio political agendas can be accomplished and perpetuated. It's no longer about raising children to be critical thinkers, equipped with real skills, a proper work ethic, uh, and the discipline and humility to be functional members of a practical and efficient society. It's about programming young minds into a herd mentality that makes them docile and easily controlled by the people, by the people who serve the powers and principalities of dark heavenly places. These minions of darkness have infiltrated the highest seats of both government and academia, as well as many of our religious organizations. Therefore, the indoctrination that accompanies much of modern education precludes many from ever setting foot on a path that could, pop, that could potentially or possibly lead them anywhere near the true wisdom of God. You see, wisdom is not simply a cognitive thing. As Alistair Book, it needs a sound moral foundation. As Alistair Begg puts it, an educational system that does not begin with wisdom, that is based on a relativistic approach to information and to morality, is destined to eventually crumble because inherent in wisdom is the ability to discriminate and discern right from wrong. In other words, stable and enduring wisdom cannot be built on the premise of flimsy and inconsistent morality. But of course, the concept of wisdom being predicated on clear distinctions between right and wrong is considered an old-fashioned idea, an outdated idea these days. It's completely antithetical to the erratic ethos of our relativistic society. Wisdom requiring moral integrity involves stable standards, and stable standards involve immutable absolutes. Immutable absolutes force us to consider the wholeness of truth and not just the part that tickle our fickle fancies. The exposure to the holiness of God's truth leads us into the reality of God's holiness and his divinity. The reality brings us into his perfect light where our wicked proclivities come face to face with his unflinching and immutable morality. Carnal man hates the light because it destroys the shadows of his contrived ignorance that guards his sin. He would rather depend on his own duplicitous wit that allows him to continue in his sin than to put his faith in the infinite wisdom of God that requires him to turn from his sin. Man treats wisdom and morality like a buffet bar. He takes only what is palatable to his own desires and avoids, any, avoids anything that doesn't please, that doesn't stimulate his carnal taste buds. Now, I reckon by now you, you're asking yourself, what does any of this have to do with today's passage? Well, I'm so glad you asked because it has everything to do with today's passage. Because of this vacillating, self centric attitude toward God's truth, man has always had the same ambivalent and, and arbitrary insolence toward God's law. Man, subjected to his own free will and the sin nature born out of it, has always regarded God's law as something to be begrudgingly kept instead of something to be embraced and cherished. People see it as the eating of a tyrant that must be obeyed under the threat of death and not the product of a loving father's benevolent will for his children. It is regarded as a rule book full of do's and don'ts instead of a blueprint for a godly and holy life that leads us home into the eternal care of our Heavenly Father. But one of the greatest testimonies to the enduring veracity of Scripture is that man has continually tried to tear it down 
or twisted to fit his own inane sensibilities. But God's word has survived every assault. From the days of Israel when they would have stoned the prophets because God's word contradicted what they wanted to hear. To rejecting God's word when it came from the very mouth of the Son of God himself. To the martyrdom of God's messengers throughout the centuries. To the popes who tried to rewrite it to fit their own political, social, and even personal agendas. Through the age of enlightenment and the attempt by 19th century Cultists such as Joseph Smith, Charles T. Russell, and William Miller to rewrite the Bible to conform to their own personal postulations. And even into today, where many question the inerrancy of Scripture, some even suggesting that parts or even all of the Bible be discarded and done away with. Calling it outdated. God's Word still endures. By the sheer power of the Holy Spirit, Scripture has overcome every attempt to twist and bastardize it into something that was pleasing to carnal man's heart. But let me tell you, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Isaiah 48. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The psalmist said of God in Psalm 119, verse 160, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. That is because Jesus Christ, according to the writer of Hebrews, is the same today, yesterday, today, and always. Hebrews 13, 8. It seems that of all God's wonderful attributes, the one that seems the hardest for us to grasp is his immutability. As imperfect people who have to grow and change, we understand that this growth and change is necessary and we have to improve. It's part of life. Even the pagan understands that in order for him to succeed in whatever he does, he must be willing to modify his behavior, skills, and knowledge. But God is under no such compunction. God is perfect, pure, and pristine. He cannot improve upon that. God is not man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Numbers 23, 19. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming from down from the fathers of light, whom, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. James 1, 17. As he is perfect and errant, so is his word. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the cleanse of his heart to all generations. Psalm 33, 11. Though the word will tell you that culture and experience dictates and defines our truths, that's a lie. The fact of the matter is there's only one truth, and that is the truth of God. Therefore, culture does not have any effect on God's truth or his righteousness or his law. God is faithful. He does not change his mind. And nowhere more, nowhere in Scripture is that more demonstrated than right here on this mountainside and in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. Perhaps more than ever, many more Christians today are unsure of exactly what God's, what God's law, the role of God's law in their lives. Some think it has none. Got Jesus paid the price so we can do what we want. We don't have to worry about the law. Others think that we got to do all this craziness just to ensure that we keep every law. But most of us are kind of no magnet in between. We, you know, we're kind of vacillating exactly where we stand on. That is why it's so important that we take this opportunity to listen to what Jesus says about his law here. This is the second person of the Trinity speaking. The Son. He's the one that wrote the law. I think he knows more about it than anybody else, so that's where we need to get our information. So in verse 17 it says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now we have to understand what he's talking about when he says the law and the prophets. The law is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Jews call this the Torah. The prophets include not only the Old Testament books of the prophets, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and, uh, and Daniel and on up to Malachi. But according to Jesus in, in Luke 16, 6, 
all the way up to John the Baptist. But they all, the, the prophets also include the historical books from Joshua to Esther and the five books of wisdom, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. So when Jesus uses the word law, he's using the Greek word nomos. Now nomos can refer to any st statute, law, precept, or injunction. But here he's referring to the Torah. We can discern this from the context in which Jesus uses it. First, he makes a common distinction between the law and the prophets. And that would immediately tell the Jewish audience that he was preaching to what he was talking about. But that, the law and the prophets is how they refer to what we call the Old Testament. Then, then in verse uh, 18, he, he makes, uh, he speaks to the authority of the law. In 19, he speaks to the power that the commands within the law should have in our lives. And in verse 20, he speaks to the personal, spiritual, intimate relationship that we should have with this law. And then after this, the next 21 to 48 verses is all about individual laws that are in his law. And he tells them, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. Now this probably helped the Pharisees out a little bit if they were listening. Because see, in the first 16 verses, Jesus had made some pretty radical statements about what it was to be, a, to be part of the kingdom of heaven. Many of the things he said were completely contradictory to the religious paradigms of that day, and for that matter, to much of the silliness that passes for religion today. Instead of saying God's blessings include material wealth and status, like many believe, he told them, blessed are the poor in spirit. Instead of promising a worldly type of blissfulness, he told them, blessed are those who mourn. Instead of congratulating those people who pranced around in the prestige of their own religious works, he told them that it would be the meek who would inherit the earth. Instead of promising them their, instead of promising them their best life now, he told them that their blessings would include being persecuted and reviled for his righteousness sake. That was pretty radical stuff. But up to this point, the most staggering thing about his sermon was not what he had said, but what he had not said. You see, he had said nothing about the traditional interpretation of the law or showing any reverence to the Pharisees or scribes on their rabbinical teachings about the law. <laughs> this had to be a little disconcerting to the Pharisees and scribes. Did Jesus want to overthrow the law? Did he come to usurp our power? Now, the fear of the Pharisees was not wholly about their position being taken from them, though that was surely a big part of it. Part of their concern was that if the law was taken, taken away as a means of merit, no one would make the effort to keep it. Rules were there to keep people in line, and without rules, people would live any old way they pleased. So far, what they were hearing is Jesus was offering this free and easy religion with no consequences of sin. But nothing could be further from the truth, and Jesus gets to that point here in this part of the sermon. Jesus are not to be antinomians. Antinomianism <clears throat> teaches that because God's grace is greater than our sin, we are no longer obligated to keep the, to keep the law. Antinomians believe that we can live hedonistic lives completely contrary to the nature and will of God without any regard for his law and still be saved by grace. They believe that the more you sin, the more grace you receive. So they sin as much as they can so they can receive more grace. But that's a lie straight from Satan's mind. They still got his bad breath lingering on him. So they get this from Romans 5.20 where Paul writes, The law came in to increase the trespass, and where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. But again, context is everything. The word now... It's just like the word therefore. If you see now, you've got to go back and see what it said in the preceding verse. So we have to consider at least verse 19. And then also, verse 20 ends in a comma which tells us that this sentence had not completed its thought and continues on into verse 21. So when we read this, 519 through 21, we get a better understanding of what Paul means. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. 
Now the law came in to the increase of trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, when you read all that together, what it, what, what it is saying here is that Adam introduced sin to humanity. He introduced the sin nature that causes all of us to sin, and therefore, because of that sin, we are condemned. But God's grace is greater than our sin because Jesus comes in, and through his redemptive work, he had taught not only atoned for our sin, but he gave us his righteousness. And for all, for all those who believe, who receive that righteousness, they will live in that righteousness. So this is not a passage about granting people a license to sin. It's about encouraging people to submit to the righteousness that saved them. He made this very clear in Romans 3, 31. Did we overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We can get a clearer understanding if we read the first eight verses of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. For the, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh or sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh in order that righteous, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. God's grace doesn't free us from the responsibility to walk in righteousness, but rather it gives us the ability to walk in righteousness. So as Jesus goes into this discourse about God's law, he's making everything clear. I'm not opposed to the law, and I have no intentions of destroying it. What he will do, however, is revisit the commandments of God and repair the damage that centuries of man's mishandling of the law had done to it. Many times throughout their history, the leaders of Israel took some very egregious liberties, created license with God's law. God was constantly sending them prophets and judges to correct them and bring them back in line. God very often in the Old Testament, through the request of my wife, I will not go through all of these, referred to Israel as a stubborn and stick-necked people. I've got at least eight verses of that. My favorite is this, though. In Isaiah 48, 4, God told them, I know that you are obstinate and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead brass. You're obstinate, stiff-necked, and hard-headed. Now that's a pretty brutal but spot-on assessment. Now if they were pig-headed when God was talking to them and speaking in Israel, imagine just how dumb they got in the 400 years of silence when God wasn't speaking in Israel between Malachi and, and, and John the Baptist. Remember, Alexander the Great, his policy when he conquered the territory was to Hellenize it, to introduce Greek culture and Greek philosophy. Oh, you can run yourself, but you've got to have our culture and you've got to have our philosophy. And then when the Seleucid Greeks tried to outlaw Judaism, the Maccabees spent 24 years fighting against them, fighting against the Hellenization. When they finally won and took power, you know what they did? They introduced into Judaism the very Greek culture and, and, and philosophy that they had fought 24 years to keep out of it. And this upset this certain little group, this small group called the Holy Ones, who would end up becoming the Pharisees. And by the time Rome brought Israel to Roman authority and set up an enemy king, remember Herod was not a Jew. He was an Edomite who was a historical enemy of Israel. And they made him the vassal king of the Jews who was loyal to Rome. Well, the Pharisees, they had an uneasy reliance with him, and they grew in social strength and political power. 
In their newfound power, the Pharisees saw it as their responsibility to re-clarify God's law for the people and to implement measures that would prevent the law from ever being corrupted again. But you know what they've done? In their very effort, effort, they corrupted God's law. Anytime you tamper with it, there is the very real danger you're going to corrupt it. How bad did they corrupt it? There are 613 commands in the Old Testament. But the Pharisees created, created over 1,500 additional fence laws for the people to obey. They believed the best way to keep people from breaking God's law was to build a protective barrier around it. <clears throat> Even though God never told them to do such a thing. The people of Jesus' day were now burdened by man-made legalistic rules that God never commanded. How ridiculous were some of these laws? Here's a couple examples. You can't spit on you can't spit on the Sabbath because it would disturb the dirt, and that would be considered plowing, which would make you guilty of working on the Sabbath. You could not swat a fly on the Sabbath because then you would be guilty of hunting on the Sabbath. They created lap loopholes to get around some laws, such as if your house was burning down on the Sabbath, you could not carry clothes out of it. However, you were allowed to put on several layers of clothes while the house was burning down around you, and then you could wear them out of the house. You just couldn't carry it out of the house. This was the kind of nonsense they were introducing. In their effort to ensure the external keeping of the law and the prophets, the Pharisees had lost sight of the spirit of the law and the rest of Scripture. They were trying to fix things from the outside in instead of the inside out. They were like doctors doing cosmetic surgery to hide the superficial effects of cancers on someone without ever addressing the cancer itself. They were doing a lot of window dressing without cleaning up the mess on the inside. So Jesus was neither giving a new law or modifying the old, but rather explaining the true significance of the moral context of Moses' law and the rest of the Old Testament. Jesus had not come to abolish any part of the law, but he had come to separate God's law from the foolishness that the Pharisees had added to it. In other words, Jesus was not the abolition of the law and the prophets, but he was the fulfillment of it. The entirety of the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Every part symbolizes Christ in some extraordinary way. People think that the Old Testament is about a mean and vindictive old man God with a bone to pick with humanity, while the New Testament is about a young and newer and hip God who just wants to buy the world a coat and teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. But it's the same God throughout the whole scripture from in the beginning in Genesis to amen in Revelation. The law frames the law frames particulars of his righteousness. The prophets were not only the mouthpieces of his will in Israel, but they also prophesied about the nature, conditions, and purposes of its coming. Israel's ceremonial sacrifices pointed to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. The ram with its horns caught in the bushes that took Isaac's place on the altar pointed to Christ's sacrifice on Calvary for man. The animal slain to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve's sin, that was Christ. The ark that weathered the deluge, that was Christ. The man who ate with Abraham at the oaks of Mamre with the pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. The gods who rained down the fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis is the same God that will tread upon his enemies in the winepress of God's wrath in Revelation. The same Lord that led the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt is the same Lord that leads us out of our bondage of sin. The same Lord that provided manna from heaven for the hungry Israelites is the same Lord who provides us the spiritually starved today the manna of salvation. The same Lord who gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai in Exodus is the same Lord explaining the very same law from a hillside here in the Gospel of Matthew. It is his law. He wrote it. There is, he wasn't there to abolish anything but the rhetoric that had been added to it. The Pharisees had driven his law down a dusty and a muddy road and he was there now to clean it up.
All the law and the prophets point to Jesus. It previewed his holiness, his power, and his righteousness. So when he said he had come to fulfill the law, Christ was indicating that he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets in all their aspects. He fulfilled the prophecies of the prophet in that he was the promised one. He fulfilled the doctrinal teachings of the law that he brought the law into full revelation with his coming. He fulfilled the moral law that he fulfilled the moral law by keeping it perfectly. He fulfilled the ceremonial law by being the embodiment of everything that those ceremonial sacrifices were in the old days of Egypt. He, I mean, Israel. He fulfilled the judicial law by personifying God's perfect justice. He fulfilled the moral and legal demands of the law by humbling himself to be, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He fulfilled the penalty of law for us by, with his death on the cross. He fulfilled God's perfect plan of salvation to redeem his people to himself. Verse 18 says, For truly I say to you, whenever Jesus says, For truly I say to you, it's, it's his way of saying, Listen, this is fact I'm fixing to give you. It's sort of, it, he talks about the authority in which he speaks. It's sort of like when the prophets in old days would say, Thus saith the Lord. When he says, For truly I say to you, Listen, you need to get this. And he says, until the heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not one dot, or jot, or tittle, which version, whichever version you read, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Here, Christ affirms the absolute inerrancy and absolute authority of the Old Testament as the Word of God, down to the smallest stroke, letter, the smallest jot, or tittle. For he truly tells us that the New Testament should not be seen as supplanting the Old Testament, but that's fulfilling and explicating. For example, all the ceremonial requirements and the requirements of the Mosaic Law were fulfilled in Christ and no longer observed to be observed by Christians. Paul pointed this out in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, when he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These these are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment to those things. So yet, not the smallest letter stroke had been erased. The underlying proof is still alive and still there in Jesus Christ. So it hasn't been changed. And in fact, with the revelation of Jesus Christ, we have more clarity about what those mysteries were. Now, when he says that iota or not a dot, a jot or a tittle, he's talking about the smallest letters in the Hebrew alphabet. They're no more than an apostle. Some of them would be no more than a little, a little tail of a Y. So none of that is being changed. Every T, every T is crossed, every I is dotted, and it's not going to change until all is accomplished. I like what Adam Clark wrote in the New Testament of our Lord, Savior and Savior Jesus Christ, when he said, Though all earth and hell should join together to hinder the accomplishment of the great designs of the Most High, yet it shall be all in vain. Even in, in the sense of a single letter shall not be lost. The words of God, which point out his designs, are as unchangeable as his nature itself. Verse 19, he goes on, he says, Whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches, Others to do the same will be called the least in heaven. There are consequences for practicing or teaching disobedience to any of God's word. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law that fails in one aspect becomes guilty of them all. Those who are flippant toward God's law will be called the least in heaven. Jesus tells us in Matthew 20.23 20, that determining rank in heaven is God's prerogative alone. And Jesus declares here that he will hold in the lowest esteem those who hold his law, his word, in low esteem. There's no impunity for believers who disobey, discredit, or belittle God's law. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Judgment seat metaphorically refers to the place where Jesus will sit to evaluate believers. For the purpose of giving them their eternal reward. It is translated from the Greek word bima, which is an elevated platform where victorious athletes 
went to receive their crown. Think about how they did first, second place on the little platform. That's why he's talking about the Bema Seat. <clears throat> the Greek word for good and evil here did not refer to moral good or moral bad. The Savior completely dealt with the matter of sin. He dealt with that on the cross. The words are kakos and agathos. Kakos means not necessarily evil, but of a bad nature or troublesome or injurious. Agathos means of being of good constitution or excellent nature, being useful. Think about this, a spaghetti strainer is a good tool in the kitchen if you use it for what it's supposed to be used for. But it's quite useless and worthless as a punch bowl, or if you're trying to bail water out of a boat. So no, good and evil here refers to that which, those things that we do for the glory of God and those things we do for ourselves. The things we do for the glory of God, we will receive reward. But we will burn up a lot of our deeds because a lot of times our own pride and selfishness gets involved and Jesus will judge us on what we did for the glory of his kingdom. Now he's clearly not talking about the loss of salvation because even though the offenders will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, the fact is they will be there. So, but whoever does teach them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The positive result is that whoever teaches God's word will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So finally in verse 20, he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, he says, For I tell you, he's announcing his own authority there. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This must have been a very daunting proposition in the minds of his audience. The scribes and Pharisees took their devotion to the law, especially the external demonstration of their devotion, to a whole new level. Given the scribes and Pharisees' incredible level of devotion, how could the average everyday Joe ever hope to exceed their righteousness? The Pharisees' devotion to their law was intense. It remains so even today. In early 1992, tenants left three apartments in an Orthodox neighborhood in Israel burned to the ground while they asked a rabbi whether a phone call to the fire department on the Sabbath violated Jewish law. Observant Jews are forbidden to use the phone on the Sabbath because doing so would break an electrical current, which is considered a form of work. In the half hour it took the rabbi to decide yes, it would violate the law, the fire spread to the two neighboring apartments and burned them all down. To the naked eye, this kind of devotion is, is unreal. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees seemed spotless to these people. It was unattainable. And they were right, it was unattainable, even for the Pharisees, because they were pursuing a perfection that they could never accomplish. No matter how fanatical and neurotic they got in their pursuit, their pursuit was in vain. Had they forgotten the words of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Though the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was impressive to human observation, it could not prevail before God. It was just a bunch of superficial posture. It had no internal root. Jesus, when he pronounced the seven woes on the scribes in Matthew 23, he said, they tie up, speaking of the Pharisees, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move, move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. He called them blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. He said that they cleaned the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they were full of greed and self-indulgence. He said that they were like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. He told them that they were outwardly appeared, they do outwardly appear righteous to others, but within they were full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You see, it's not the quantity of our righteousness that Jesus is after, it's the quality. It's not our individual righteousness that he wants. He wants that 
righteousness that he gives us. He's calling us to a deeper and more radical holiness than the Pharisees. Pharisaism tended to soften the law's demand by focusing only on external obedience. But Jesus was referring to the righteousness that starts inside the new hearts that he gives us through his salvific works. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put it within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So see, Jesus had not come to destroy the law, but to give us a better means of following it. <coughs> so that's the kind of righteousness we have to have. Or as he says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Heaven has a very strict membership policy. It has a very strict dress code. You can't just show up to heaven's doorstep clothed in any of any old righteousness and expect to be admitted. The rags of our own righteousness are insufficient. A work-based salvation is no salvation at all. Scripture teaches repeatedly that sinners are capable of nothing but a flawed and imperfect righteousness. None are righteous, no not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Only those clothed in the righteousness of Christ shall be allowed inside. Therefore, the only righteousness by which sinners may be justified is the perfect righteousness of God that is imputed to those who believe. The Apostle Paul put it like this. He was a former Pharisee and he wrote in Philippians 3, 4-11, If anyone thinks he has reasonable confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I have gained, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing work of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I have suffered the loss of all things of my own that comes from the law. But that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that, that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The only way any of us get in heaven, loved ones, is through his righteousness, through faith in his delight, death, burial, and resurrection in the ascension of Jesus Christ. His works and his works alone punched our ticket into heaven. If any of us are ever asked why we're going to heaven, and we start off in the first person to answer that question, I'm going because I'm a good person, I'm going because I did this or I did that, then we've already messed up and got it all wrong. We can only answer that question in the third person. Because he lived the life that I could not live and paid the price that I could not pay. Because he, who knew no sin, took my sin with him upon the cross. Because he washed me in his precious blood and clothed me in his perfect righteousness. Because he is mighty to save a wretch like me and make me worthy of his kingdom. I was just like the thief on the cross. He did nothing. He did nothing but believe. And just like Abraham, Abraham, the thief on the cross, got in the same way. He believed and it was counted as righteousness toward him. We must preach the gospel to ourselves every day. And if we fail to do that, then we would be just like the Pharisees and we'll drift off into our own sense of works-based faith where we think our salvation is contingent on us. And once we do that and we fall into that trap, we'll either fall into an abject state of despair when we're confronted with our own insufficiency or our hearts will harden with a terrible kind of arrogance that blinds us to the grace that God so freely offers us. So let us walk every day in his law and according to his statutes. Let us stay in his word so we'll know how to walk. All for his glory. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. 
Thank you for your word and thank you for your law. Lord, we try to walk obediently to it, but we know we stumble. We know sometimes there's just things that we should know, but we don't know. And, but don't let it be because of our will for ignorance. Let us stay in your, your book so that, we can, so that we can know your word and know your statutes. Holy Spirit, guide us, lead us, and keep us forever faithful to the Lord that was faithful to us. We ask all this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And together God's people said, Amen. Amen.